Are you looking to become a better real estate investor? Then hang on because you're about to experience another episode of the world's most popular real estate podcast, The Bigger Pockets Podcast. But before we get to this week's show, I wanted to invite you to become part of our community, biggerpockets.com, the real estate investing social network. The membership is free and you'll instantly gain access to networking opportunities, educational content, investor tools, and more. Sign up now and get a free copy of our book, The Ultimate Beginner's Guide to Real Estate Investing, read by hundreds of thousands of budding entrepreneurs. Just click this link right here or just head to biggerpockets.com. With that, let's get to the show. This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, Show 52. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everybody? This is Josh Dorkin, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with my man, Brandon Turner. What up, B? What up, Jay? How's it going? It's going all right, man. It's going yeah. all right. How's your week been? You want to tell people what you've been up to? <laughs> <laughs> Laugh at my misfortune. I will laugh at your misfortune. People get a kick so, out of this. But before I, mean, I tell you what, what my week was like, I, I will tell you that uh, I got a Facebook message from my brother-in-law who said, your new nickname is Murphy. <laughs> so I was, in, uh, I was in Southern California for the past two, uh, two and a half weeks for holiday with the, uh, the family. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was cool, man. We drove out, had a good time, arrived, had to go to the emergency room. Uh, a couple days later, <laughs> Christmas morning, had to go to the emergency room. Uh, that night, daughter almost drowned. A couple days later, she fell off a horse. A couple days later, I had to go to the emergency room. And, you know, when I got home from our wonderful trip after a nice long drive with the family, of course I show up to a house whose boiler was not functioning. Nice. So, yeah, so when we got in, it was a nice uh, balmy 40 degrees in here with the bricks as cold as ice in my nice brick house. Well, and this so, has been the week where everything in the country froze. Like This was like the coldest in 20 years or whatever. And Yeah, it's awful, man. Yeah, you had is, no boiler. That's awesome. And I, can't, and I can't complain. Like Honestly, like 40 degrees in my house is better than like <laughs> minus 500 up in Canada and like you know, Detroit and other places. Well, so. well, for those who can't see, because this is obviously an audio podcast, Josh is in a like Eskimo parka, parka <laughs> on this, on this podcast recording right now. So it's pretty great. He's, he's bundled up nice and warm. Yep. That's yep, awesome. For sure. For sure. <laughs> anyway, well, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad you got your kicks off yes. of my misfortune. Yeah, it was great. I, I yeah. like laughing at your pain. Anyway, <laughs> Well, yeah, man. So we we got a we got a cool show today. I, I I think this is one. Well, I know this is one that that you are personally very excited about because uh, our our guest is one that uh, you've been a monster fan of for a long time. It's like Justin Bieber to me. Yeah, that's kind of <laughs> creepy. So so what you're saying is you like. Justin I, Bieber? No, no, no. I like our guest today, like some people like Justin Bieber. Oh, admire okay. and respect and look up to. Yes, because Justin Bieber is. is I admire and respect and admire Justin Bieber as well. Yes, of course. Of course. <laughs> all right. So, so today's guest is uh, Mr. Ken McElroy. Ken's a very active real estate investor and the author of the ABCs of Real Estate Investing and the Advanced Guide to Real Estate Investing, uh, two bestseller books, yeah? Yeah, those are uh, two amazing books. They're actually on our list of like the top 21 best real estate books, Yeah, and uh, yeah. which I'll link to in the show notes. For sure, for sure. Well, so so Ken started out, the cool, the cool thing about the story is Ken started out like most of our listeners with absolutely nothing and, and now runs a company with over 250 employees doing multi-million dollar deals left and right. So, uh, you, you know, he's, he's definitely somebody to get inspired from um, and, and learn from. Today, we're, we're going to talk about uh, his story and even get into some specifics on a $9 million a car apartment complex that he funded in just 20 minutes, which is a pretty cool story. So, of course, be sure to stick around for that. Um, but uh, really quick, before we uh, bring in Ken, we've got to do our quick, quick tip. tip. 
All right, today's quick tip is make sure to check out the Bigger Pockets member blogs. We uh, we send you guys to the Bigger Pockets blog all the time, but we also have this network of uh, blogs that anyone can create a blog for, and uh, there's a ton of really really good content in there. So uh, definitely jump in there and and see what your peers are writing about at BiggerPockets.com/blogs. And uh, for those of you who are wondering how we decide on who shows up on the Bigger Pockets blog, we actually do uh, pick our bloggers mostly from the Bigger Pockets member blog uh, area of the site. So if you're interested in potentially becoming a writer on the Bigger Pockets blog, uh, get working on one of our member blogs and uh, maybe we'll ask you to come and join us. Cool. That's actually how I started. It is indeed. Yeah. There you go. See? Quick tip. Quick tip. All right. Yeah, yeah. All right, man. Let's get to the show. Long intro. Sorry to keep you guys waiting, but uh, you know, well worth it. Let's uh, let's get to it. Ken, welcome to the show. Good to have you here, man. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be on. Awesome. Yeah, it's it's good to have you. And I, I have said this on previous podcasts, but I might as well say it here publicly to you, Ken. Your uh, ABCs of Real Estate Investing, uh, that book, is actually what got me into apartment investing and why I bought my first apartment complex. So I want to say thank you. I mean, that good, was... Uh, well, I hope it worked out. It did. It, I still have it today. <laughs> and, I, and, and I love that thing. So um, yeah, thank you. This is going to be... Yeah. I've been looking forward to this show for a while. He's very excited. I am excited. Look at this. Look at me. All right. Go ahead, Brandon. Come on. All right. First question we like to ask everyone. Well, before I actually ask the first question, let's actually go back a little further. How long have you been investing for? Then I'll ask the normal. First ah, question. good question. Well, I, I, you know, I grew up in the Northwest, so um, not far from where you are, Ren. And, and that's uh, awesome. so uh, I, I, I went to Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma, okay. and uh, I started buying um, small single families and condos. Uh, you know, just like a lot of people, how they start. So uh, that was uh, in the late '80s. Okay, cool. And uh, I guess, how did you, I mean, you got started, was that in college or right after college? Right after, I, I, yeah, I, I completely stumbled on it, you know, like a lot of people do in real estate. It wasn't calculated. I didn't go to school for it or anything like that. I actually went to school for business. Um, and I, uh, I just completely stumbled on a buddy of mine that was doing a, um, um, uh, you know, a condo project and I ended up buying one of them. Oh, okay. Nice. Okay, cool. Can you, can you kind of tell us a little bit about that first project? Yeah, yeah. It was a, a two bedroom, two bath. It was like a hundred. I think it was about a hundred and ten grand, and it cash flowed like a hundred dollars a month, uh, right at a hundred. That is, of course, if it was occupied. So yeah, nice, nice. And then you know, like a lot of people, I just kept doing it, and uh, and and luckily, I was in the property management business, uh, which was also I lived in Seattle, and um, so I was I was managing properties all up and down. Um, you know, um, I five interstate five there, uh, all the way up into your, into your area. Actually, I had some stuff in Aberdeen and all oh, the nice. way down, all the way north up into Bellingham. So I kind of cut my teeth in the Northwest, you know, learning, uh, all about tenants and occupancies and rents and expenses. And, and so that was really my competitive advantage. So when I got it, when I got an opportunity to buy, uh, I really, I really pretty much understood the business. Okay. So. So what got you uh, into the property management field? You got that first condo. Why'd you decide to suddenly yeah, deal well, with the headaches? Like most students, I was broke. I had no money. <laughs> uh, I needed a place to stay. And my buddy was working for the company. It's a big company in Seattle now. It's called um, Pinnacle. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and um, it was at the time called Goodman Management, John Goodman. And uh, he worked there. He called me up and said, "Hey, uh, I'll give you a free place to stay and a and a salary," and um, that was it. So th- I did it. So, so you started working for Roseanne's husband. Yeah, exactly right. That's that, nice. That's the same guy. Yeah. No. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was so, like, well, I didn't know he no, was a real estate. Guy. I, I, I literally, <laughs> I, I was loaded with student debt, and I had, um, you know, it was a, just a very little salary, and of course, when you're a student, you have none. So a little salary and a free place to to live um, was a good place to start, and and then I actually I learned a lot about the business. It, it was a sixty unit apartment building, right downtown Seattle uh, at um, um, Cedar and Fourth, so right by Como TV and underneath the Space Needle. Uh, so that's where I started. Oh, okay. that sounds great. Yeah, you know it, it's it's something I hear a lot of people do is is 
barter their their time um, for for free rent as a resident manager. And and I'm you know we haven't really talked to anybody who's done that before. I I'd be curious to kind of pick your brain a little bit about uh, what that was like. Yeah. Well, it was a huge education. I, you know, my dad was in the had a construction company, so I did know a little bit about how to fix things. But um, man, trying to figure out how to how to uh, keep the place clean, keep the place occupied, market it, um, do the books and all that kind of stuff. Um, the, you know, school cannot prepare you for those things. And I just had a lot of people uh, at my disposal, and the ones that, and the things I didn't know, I I I, um, I asked. And uh, I ended up staying there about a year, year and a half. I got my real estate license while I was there. Okay. And then I, I started to work for that company uh, more on a regional basis. Uh, but there's, well, I could, we could do a whole show just on the stories from that, that one. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so cool. you got thrown into the fire and, and pretty much learned uh, very quickly that way. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, literally, no, no joke, uh, the manager and the assistant manager. So my very first job was to fire both of them. And, um, you know, I was fresh out of college. I'd never terminated anybody in my life. And it was a huge education because I, uh, you know, I had to, I had, uh, you know, people, people that lived there uh, were a little upset, you know, when they had like, you know, like pay rent, you know, those kinds of things. So, yeah, so anyway, Wait, I have to pay to live. Yeah. <laughs> on, we're just here to party and have fun. So, um, it was fun from that standpoint, but, um, Boy, the stories, uh, I can go on and on and on and on. It was, it was, it was a great way to start. It well, sounds like cool. a great way. Yeah, we, I mean, real, really quick, would you recommend other people uh, start out that way or, or yeah, do you think? I would. I would. In fact, it's funny you ask that question. We actually have had people that want to work for our company now because now I have a large firm, as you know, and it's based in Scottsdale, Arizona. We have 250 employees. Oh, wow. And so what we do is we actually um, – we actually take people and put them at the property first, so they understand what it, what, it, what it's like to lease a unit, what it's like to to clean a unit, what it's like to deal with a resident dispute, what it's like to collect rent or or, or try to collect rent, um, and you know all the pressures and all the things that that happen at the site level because it makes them more valuable uh, when they work in the corporate office. Okay, cool. Well, well, hey, let's move on a little bit to something we like to ask a lot of our guests because. I mean, especially guys like you who have written books before and, and you know a little more well known. We want to know a little bit about like mistakes or things that you've maybe screwed up on in your life. You know, do you mind sharing some of like the I guess the downsides or things that haven't gone so well for you? You, you want me to just focus on today? You mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What did you What did you break today, Ken? Come on. <laughs> well, I you know it's funny. Uh, school kind of teaches you not to make mistakes. Um, you know, obviously. Um, and so I, I was afraid, I guess, when I first got out of school to even, um, to even admit that. And it took me a while to figure out that the faster that you fail and the faster you make mistakes, the actually the smarter, the more educated you get. Um, and you know, not, I, I wouldn't, I never took any real massive risks, but I always took small risks. Um, and, uh, boy, I, I really have quite a few mistakes. I mean, you know, in every single way and mistakes in, in the, what I thought I needed to do before I bought a building, mistakes in hiring people, mistakes in raising equity and, and getting debt, um, mistakes in the property management business when I was in that. Um, gosh, it's just uh, mistakes in hiring um, employees at, at a later date, mistakes of making the wrong, you know, choice of resident or tenant, you know, yeah. that, that into your property and the list goes on and on and on. All right. And, and maybe we yeah. can touch on some of those as we kind of dig in a little bit. Uh, you know, wh what I'm curious about is, uh, you know, you started with this resident management, you got your real estate license, um, you, you, you started to kind of expand from there. Can you very, very quickly, just so the listeners have an idea of where, where you started and where you are today, you know, you yep. said you have 250 employees, but what was, what was kind of the path, right? So you, yeah, you yeah. got that management job next, what happened? Yeah, well, well, for the very first company that I worked for that I mentioned earlier, I started on site and then I started managing multiple properties, uh, four units, eight units, 12 units, 20 units, and I learned that. And then as I was with the company a little bit, I started getting larger and larger properties. I ended up moving to Las Vegas, opening an office for them when I was 28 years old, and um, and 
we, uh, uh, you know, we, we had, we did not have a presence there. And I, uh, you know, again, I opened an office, hired new people. And, and at that point I was in what, what they call the fee management business. I was actually going out and managing properties for other people for a fee. And, um, and so yeah, I was really fortunate, I think, for the first eight years of, of uh, my career to, to come up in the property management world. Um, and I was actually getting an education of the people I was managing properties for. So you, I would, you know, people would buy properties and then come to us and, and ask to manage it. So I, I got to understand how they capitalized it, you know, with the debt and equity and, and how they bought it, and what price they bought it for and all those kinds of things. So that was my first real job. Um, and when I was in Las Vegas and then I partnered, um, uh, on my first business, I've had many now, um, over the years. Um, but I partnered with my first business in the, in the early nineties, um, uh, mid nineties and, um, which was, I'm going to do this on my own. So I started in, uh, that I, uh, we were building properties and buying properties and, and now to fast forward, I started this company that I have now, which is called MC companies. Um, we have 8,000 units in uh, multiple states, mostly Texas, Oklahoma, uh, Arizona, uh, and we buy and build apartments. So all, all, we're just in the apartment business. That's it. Um, we have uh, five, five, six projects under construction right now. I've got one in escrow right now in Tulsa, Oklahoma that I'm buying. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll probably buy, I think uh, we're scheduled to do somewhere between two and 300 million and acquisitions are ready for 2014. Wow. And, That's awesome. So, uh, so these are large multifamily properties. These aren't like 5, 10, 15, 30 units. These are like in, in the hundreds. Right. Yes. Uh, great question, Joshua. I, I started on those, as you know, but, but what I quickly realized is that it's, it takes the same time and effort to run an, a five unit that it does to run a 200 unit. And um, it's actually easier, in my opinion, because the larger the property, the more it's the staff it supports. Yeah. So once you can train your staff to kind of handle a lot of the day-to-day stuff, those phone calls don't come into the corporate office. They get handled right there at the property level. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, you know, on a lot of our shows so far, we focused a lot on small multifamilies and single families because, I mean, I started with small multifamily and, and a lot of people start that way, right? So today, definitely, we want to we we want to go like, you know, 201 level here and, and go with the apartment complex thing. So I guess why don't we just start at the beginning why should somebody look into, you know, large multifamily properties to invest in? Well, um, you know, I, what I chose to do early on a career, cause I had lots of choices on what I wanted to do, but I chose to uh, specialize in one sector. And I think that's a mistake a lot of people make. So a lot of people, you know, they might try to buy a retail center, try to try to go buy a strip mall and then buy a, you know, a, a duplex or, and I'm, I'm not saying that, that, that investing is wrong, but I'm saying well, what I want, what I, what I attempted to do was I wanted to really know a lot about my one business. And I also knew that there's millions of apartments in the United States. And, um, and it was just, it was easier for me to really, really understand the sector that I wanted. And then what it did is it made me an expert in that one field. So, um, everybody, um, uh, you know, I get a lot of people asking me about the apartment world because I, I literally study. I still study it. Um, uh, I'm still studying and still learning. And um, so for me, uh, it's a trend business like everything else. You know, apartments were not in favor in uh, 07, 08, 09. And um, now all of a sudden they are. They're kind of the hottest topic on Wall Street. Um, but like anything, like single family homes or malls or strip malls or, or uh, industrial or even single family custom or affordable or condos, everything has a cycle. And, um, you know, apartments are definitely a, on a high point of a cycle right now, uh, primarily due to the fallout in the single family market and, um, and the fact that we have some job creation. So, so let me ask you, you know, you, you, un- unless I misheard, it sounds like you were saying that uh, you think it's a negative that you're so specialized in in uh, apartment buildings, and I, I look at that as a positive. I, I see you as somebody who you know you can own that niche. You know, you, you yeah. you're the guy to turn to. Is there? Um, I'm just curious what you see as a negative about that, particularly oh. for somebody starting out. Yeah, no, no. I I think I don't see it as a negative at all. What okay. I what I think is. Um, 
what what happens is people um, people think that the jump from say 20 units or, or you know a bunch of houses to a 200 unit or 100 unit is a um, uh, a real significant jump and, and I'm here to tell you that I did it and it's not it's a it's literally the same thing just more units different people different team members are needed but the the economics uh, are are the same and and obviously in terms of capital uh, resources needed those are certainly going to be higher I mean if you've got 50 units you're going to need the capital to take care of those if things go wrong Absolutely. Yeah. It's all scalable. You know, the, it's just, yeah. Uh, it, you know, that's, that was one of the things, Joshua, I, I believed when I first made the jump from buying a lot of single families to larger properties is, uh, that I actually needed a bunch of money in the bank and I needed all this cash in order to start. And what I found very quickly is that there's a lot more money out there than there are deals. And so uh, once I got educated on the market and I started to find deals, even though I didn't have a nickel, uh, I found people to help me uh, with that piece. Gotcha. Yeah. gotcha. I, I definitely want to touch on the financing thing. I got that in my list of uh, like 50 million questions here for you. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, but before we go on, uh, I just want to point out, I love that you said – about you know focusing on one niche because that's something that I I harp on all the time is to pick one like niche like you know apartment single family whatever and then one strategy do you want to flip them do you want to buy and hold and when you're getting started especially you don't need to know everything people get overwhelmed so easy but just by focusing on one niche and one strategy and learn everything you can about that you can always branch out later so I, I well, love I, that and ignore the shiny object syndrome of course yeah, yeah. and th that's the problem with I mean like every week we sit down here with a guest who tells us their you know amazing story of how how they're making money in real estate and every week me and Josh are like oh we got to do that that'd be fun <laughs> <laughs> you know, and if it's happening to us you know it's it's happening to our listeners as well and and yeah. we we get it but you know to to them we say you know definitely take all this stuff in and decide what works best for you really learn it and then once you've become good at it move on to the next thing that's exactly right. Yeah. It's yeah. baby steps and finding good team pe members around you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, so, you know, we're going to jump around a little bit and touch back upon a lot of the topics that, that, uh, you know, are, are nagging at us here, but you know, let, let's go to, um, local investing versus investing at a distance. Um, you know, it, it sounds like obviously you're, you're acquiring properties around the country, um, but you're also an expert. You've been doing this a long time. You know what to look for. You know what to do. Um, what's your take on buying uh, these multifamilies at, at a distance? Let's start yeah. with as a newbie and then kind of progress yeah. for you know, anyone yeah. else. Well, what, what a great question that is. Well, first of all, I, I, I always believe if you're either using your money or you're using somebody else's money, uh, there's a lot of responsibility with that. And, um, and so, so I always advocate, you know, try to start local, try to learn local, try to make mistakes local, um, try not to even outsource your management if you can, if you have the time, if you don't, of course, they're finding a property manager is, you know, a whole other show. Oh yeah. <laughs> but, but I, but, but it's really important. I think that, that the people you're raising capital from, especially as you start to scale, uh, knows that you understands all the uh, you understand all the different components, and so uh, there's really no way to do that if you have to jump on a flight and fly to Orlando, um, you know. Uh, and and it's 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 it, you know, but a lot of times by that time the problem's gone or over, and sometimes so so I always ad advocate to start local. Uh, I like to drive by my properties. I like to pop in unannounced. I like to walk them at night. I like to walk them during the day. I like, to, you know, there's just a lot in, uh, you know, in, in order for the properties to run well, there's so many details that need attention. Yeah. It's just so, so hard. Um, um, and I, you know, a lot of people are in that trap right now where you know, they have properties all over the country and, and they're trying to find, they're burning through property managers, um, you know, as their places are vacant and they're sitting back in California or Washington or wherever they're, frustrated and they got to fly out there for a weekend and try to interview 10 and you know on a Saturday or whatever so <clears throat> it's just easier um, 
And, um, and then what happened was when we made the decision to get larger, uh, first it became city to city. So, you know, I started um, obviously in Seattle, but then I moved to Vegas and I did it there. And then now I live in Scottsdale. And <clears throat> even though I have properties all over those places, um, when I, 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 I use that same philosophy here in Scottsdale, then I, then I started branching into Tucson and then I went up to Flagstaff, which are two hours North and South. Um, and, and again, each of those markets is no different than flying to a different state. It's, they're different. The people are different. The rents are different. Um, you know, the, the, the demographics and the, the makeup of the community are different. The community leaders and what they just, what they believe in are different. Uh, you know, all the all the jurisdictions for water, sewer, trash and utilities and everything, they're all different. So it might as well be a different state. And so I just that's how I started. I just started started to master these other cities. And then from there, I started looking at the bigger picture on the trends, the job growth, employment growth. And that's when I first started. To, that's when I went to Dallas and I bought a management company there uh, six years ago uh, during the recession. Okay. Uh, and, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Got it. Uh, Got cool. it. I actually yeah. want to dig in a little bit on that. If we could, like, what are you looking for when you say you're looking at, you know, kind of the demographics or the, the numbers in another city? I mean, is it just, I guess, what are you looking at? <laughs> just population, those kind yeah. of things. That's the best question. I, you know, people always laugh cause it's so simple, but I need renters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so, you know, yep. jobs clearly, uh, you know, sometimes even population growth doesn't bring that, you know, because you can have a senior, um, you know, influx of seniors in an area that aren't working. Um, but primarily it's job growth. So and I'll, let me give you an example. When we started to look at Texas in general, we looked at the big major ones, the you know, big major cities, uh, uh, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, Fort Worth. Um, and um, each one has a completely different genetic makeup. Uh, each one. So Dallas is more services oriented, financial. Houston is more refineries, a little more blue collar. Um, uh, San Antonio is actually healthcare and and some tech. And Austin, of course, is tech, uh, yeah. primarily tech. It's also where the state capital is. So each city is different, and each one has has uh, has a different bell curve to it. So. Um, you know, we started buying in Austin because of, uh, the, you know, uh, the spillover of what's going on over there in tech. And of course we bought there in 07, 08 and 09, we bought a bunch of property, uh, in Austin. And now of course it's one of the hottest markets in the country, yeah. but it was, and we could have been wrong, of course, but we were, what we were doing was trying to take a look at, um, where housing was, where the jobs were going and, uh, could people afford it? And, um, and so that's, we look at that uh, on an individual basis, submarket by submarket, even in those individual cities. So, you know, it's interesting when I, when I, uh, started, I, I looked at markets, what market is an affordable market, not what market is a hot market. And, yep. uh, I ended up buying in a market that was inexpensive, but which, uh, the demographic trends were going the wrong direction. And, you know, I pretty much plowed together every mistake, which was wrong demographic trends, yeah. economy turning the wrong way. I'm at a distance, so I couldn't, you know, drive and check out the property. And that really led to a lot of problems. And one of the things I like to harp on to, to new folks, you know, there's always somebody trying to sell you something. Hey, come by in you know, uh, <laughs> Cleveland. <laughs> I'm not going to say it. Come uh Come by in Cleveland or come by here because it's cheap. It's it's reasonable and and uh, you know again cheap doesn't always mean uh, that the trends are going in the right direction. So I, I think it's awesome that you know you guys are trying to buy where the renters are. I think that's that's probably the right move versus you know what I ended up doing. Yeah, that's cool. Hey hey, I have a question, kind of a big picture question on your kind of strategy, and that's how much does appreciation and versus cash flow play into your decisions. You know, you talk about buying in a hot market. Sometimes yeah. that can be uh, yeah. expensive. Great question. I, you, you probably know from, you know, I study a lot with Robert Kiyosaki a lot. Uh, we're really, really close friends. Uh, I did a radio show with him this morning, actually. Nice. Um, and, um, you know, I'm really a cash flow guy. In fact, when I read Rich Dad Poor Dad, um, that's what he talked about in there. He talked about the importance of a property manager and cash flow. And, 
And I would say the majority of the real estate investors aren't really focused on that like they should be, even though they might say they are. Yeah. Uh, most of them are capital gains based or appreciation based. I do think appreciation is important, but I don't base any of our investor uh, money or even our strategy on it um, unless it's forced. In other words, you know, if, if I'm buying a property, like I'm buying my, my property in Tulsa, Oklahoma, we're closing on the 30th of December, 208 units. Um, I'm putting a million bucks into the property. And, um, you know, with the intention of getting about somewhere between 75 and, and 90 bucks in rent growth over a two to three year period, that's, that's uh, I'm creating that appreciation. So uh, it's important, but I never do it. I never base it on on where I think the market is heading. Hey, That's Ken, awesome. re really quick for, for folks who aren't familiar with it. So the forced depreciation is when you can either increase rents or you know increase uh, vacancy rates or, or just get other revenue streams coming in. And as a result, these commercial properties' values are, are more. Is, is that correct? That's exactly right, Joshua. It's... It's essentially, you know, we found an old tired property uh, on the corner of Main and Main that is what we would call an A location. Um, you know, across the street is Whole Foods and 24-hour uh, fitness, and the area is completely changing, and the homes in the area are 500000 and higher. And then here's this property where the rents are $800, and, and it's, it was built in the 80s, and nobody spent a nickel on it. But in the mm. day, it was new. Yeah, uh, beautiful in the day. So, so uh, you know what we're what our plan is is we're gonna uh, we're gonna put washers and dryers in. We're gonna put new stainless appliances in. We're gonna put wood flooring in, um, and we're gonna we're gonna completely redo the interiors. We're also gonna paint it and and uh, you know do a bunch on the outside. But that's exactly what we're talking about. And and it, and, and, um, and we have a, a long term strategy. We're we're buying it. We're not flipping it. And, um, you know, we want to we want to be a, a good landlord uh, for the people that live there. But um, uh, a renovated unit commands higher rent than one that's unrenovated. And so that's the that's the opportunity. Sure. So when you go into a place like that, are you planning on just doing the vacant ones as they come available or you're going to kick everyone out, do it and then get it filled? Yeah, good question. Yeah. Well, the bank would not be happy if we kicked everybody. Out. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> mortgage uh, and the utilities and the taxes and you know all the other things so um, great question I get that question a lot it's we do it on on turnover so obviously when we first move when we first get on the property we'll, we'll do the vacants first um, and then we'll be testing the market on the rents um, and then as units uh, turn over and people move um, we'll do those and what we found is that a lot of times there's some amazing residents that live in these places that have been there 10 years, 15 years. And what we found is that they actually, because they like the location, will oftentimes move into the new one, which will, which will create a um, opportunity for us to renovate uh, uh, one that they're, that they were in. And so it, it, it could take, it'll take at least two years to, to, to spend all the money and, and upgrade the property. That's cool. I found the same thing. It, it created like a chain at my apartment. Each one I did, somebody would leave and then yeah, yeah. I had like six or seven people move because of that. So yeah. 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 And, and then I tell you, the other thing that's been great about doing this is that the surrounding community, um, I mean, they come out, you know, the Chamber of Commerce, the police, uh, the local police department and, and people are like, hey, we like what you're doing here, you know. So you really, um, to freshen up uh, real estate in a market that, um, um, you know, uh, people live in is, is usually a, a great PR opportunity as well. Yeah, yeah, for cool. sure. Well, well, you know, and, and you know, it, it's one of those interesting things. R real estate investors, I always ha get a bad rap. You know, there's the slumlords and the bad guy. You know, all these bad guys doing all these bad things. And this is the story right here. You know, this is what what we do. You know, we improve communities. Yeah, I mean, there are some bad folks out there. You know, we can't deny that. But you know, there isn't any segment of of the economy. Um, but you know, I th I think. It, it's it's cool for for you to even point that out is is uh, how much the community really appreciates when you do it you know on a small scale we may not notice it if we're doing a house or we're doing a two duplex or something but once you start getting to these larger properties uh, it makes a much bigger dent it does and I'll tell you you know 
yeah, this is going to sound bizarre, but thank God for those bad landlords because, you know, I get great deals. So this, yeah. guy, <laughs> this, thing, this guy that I buy this building from is an idiot. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, I mean, How do you really feel? <laughs> he's an idiot, you know, and, and uh, he's just run this thing so bad. And I just, I was talking to the property manager this morning in, in Oklahoma. By the way, we have our own management company, but I use a local guy down there in Tulsa because I really trust him and like him, and um, he's managing other property for me in the area. Um, and, um, you know, and, and I just said, I just am, I'm just happy that the tenants and the managers and the, and the staff are, are sticking around because this, this, guy is, this guy's an idiot. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, it's That's funny. awesome. Hey, so so how do you find these properties? How do you find the uh, idiot landlords who, yeah. you know, screw up and uh, you know, get it, it all wrong? You know, it's funny. You know, obviously you've got all the internet stuff that everybody in the world is looking at. Um, yeah. You know, all the websites and loop nets and things. And but my my experience has been that I've I actually haven't found very much on those very often. More than not. Um, what I'm, what I find is it's, um, it's a face-to-face -face relationship, um, almost always generates a, um, a, a lead. So, uh, let me give you an example. When we decided to buy in Dallas, Texas, we'll just say, I flew down there. I met with all the top brokerage people, spent two, three days, um, and, um, started to build relationships, got on their mailing list started to email them, call them, et cetera, flew down there, looked at deals, made offers. And so I built relationships with these people. Um, and so then what happens is, you know, there, as you know, there's always the alpha, you know, in every market, whether it's male or female. And they're always, um, they dominate that market. And they're, they're the ones, even in the single family, I found that this happens. And, and so if you can create relationships with those folks, what happens is somebody that's even thinking about it um, goes to them. And um, it's very rare uh, that, that you find uh, uh, owners that sell without first going to the market to find out what the value is. Because my experience has been a lot of them don't even know. And um, so they almost always go to some kind of a broker to find out what the thing's worth, even if they don't use them. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's been a that's been a, a really good way for us. We also have a full time acquisitions person in house, um, you know, and we probably look at um, maybe fifteen to twenty five deals a week. Gotcha, gotcha. So, are are you guys is is your acquisitions guy doing marketing, or is he just hitting the LoopNet, the co stars, or, and or just kind of dealing with potential leads that come from the brokers yeah. that you've got relationships with? Yeah. Mostly brokers uh, sending information. It's funny. It's free to get on brokers' email lists, and um, and then my experience has also been that most brokers don't understand what they have, so you know they're just commission. They're focused on the commission, and so like for example, when I saw this property come through, um, I'm buying it for nine point one million. I already know in three years it's going to be worth thirteen and a half. Wow. Yeah. So before I buy it, and I'm going to close it in, you know, what, uh, 12 days. So the, uh, you know, I have a whole plan to get it to 13 and a half million bucks. And if, if I, uh, you know, so, so most of them are focused on that commission. And, um, and so most of our leads come from that. Although we get a lot from banks and property managers and, you know, you name it. Now, are you finding, because in the residential space, the, the small residential, you know, houses, uh, MLS -y type folks, um, uh, most of those real estate agents really don't have a clue, right, uh, yeah. what, what, what it comes down to uh, uh, as it pertains to investment property. But my presumption would be that uh, the commercial guys uh, know a hell of a lot more. And, and it sounds like you're saying that may not be true. And, and I'm actually shocked to hear that, but, but yeah. it, uh, well, I, I get it. Surprised. You'd be surprised. On, <laughs> uh, now there, there's, it's like anything. Um, you know, I know, I know, I know residential real estate agents that know quite a bit yeah, about sure, sure. this, and I know some that don't know any. And and the same thing is true in the uh, brokerage world uh, for commercial. You know, you get you you get. But what happens in some of these secondary markets? You find um, you find 
just a lot less deal flow, you know, than you would in in some of the major core markets. And and in a lot of the major core markets, you're going to find, um, you know, the real deal makers. Gotcha, gotcha. That's cool. Well, hey, what is, what do you think makes a good property? You mentioned this one. We talked about forced appreciation. This one needed work. Do all of the properties you look at buy and do that? Is that what makes a good property, or or, or what are we looking for uh, if I'm going to go buy an apartment? Yeah. So, you know, kind of kind of touching base on a little bit of what we discussed already. Um, the first thing we do really is look at the market. And I think a lot of people, what they do is look at the property, you know, kind of like what Joshua did, you know, he was looking for an affordable property and something that was cheap. That's a very common issue that people do. Um, but you know, once you buy stuff like that, oftentimes, you know, there's, there's no renters. And so, uh, the first thing we do is really focus on demographics. So, and I, I probably spent half my time trying to figure out where our market's heading. Um, cause each one is, has a different bell curve, like the ones I talked about in Texas. Um, once we get past that, then we drill down into the individual market itself. So for example, Dallas is a big place, but when we decided to buy in Dallas and we bought a lot of property there in, um, uh, 08, 09 and 2010, um, uh, we bought only North. So we bought in areas like Plano, Frisco, Carrollton. Uh, uh, Addison and, and and markets that were growing, you know, because in every city there's hot areas and, and not so hot areas, and, and there's areas that that are going through redevelopment or maybe have higher crime, and then there's areas that have better school districts, um, and the path of you know the path of development is heading that way. So so we always look for that second. So once we get past those two things, then we go down into the sub market. And we start to look at opportunities in the individual submarket because then it makes it really simple. So, for example, in a in a given month, I might get twenty deals from Dallas, but I might only be interested in three or four because they fall into that spot. Gotcha. And, um, it, you know, and so that's how we underwrite every single deal. And then from there, um, usually um, they're not very good deals either <laughs> because mm. you know they're just. There's no, there's no, there's no what I call meat left on the bone at all. You know, I don't want to buy something um, that doesn't have some opportunity in it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ken, so uh, you're out there making these deals. Uh, you know, I, I'm thinking about it. I want to, I want to be you. What is, what is a day in the life of Ken look like? You know, and I, I, I don't need the, you know, mundane like, you know, eight. Cheerios and, and <laughs> brush your hair kind of stuff because I I know Good, if I, I asked. <laughs> um, so really, um, you know, my entire goal of my company was to replace myself. So that that was my goal from the beginning and still is. So I actually believe it or not, I take all summer off. I spend time with my kids. Um, I have a home in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Um, and, um, and I work probably 30, 40 hours a week at this point. And I, uh, anything that I ever touched or did, I try to re- find somebody better than me to do it. So that was, that was always my goal. Cause I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be chained to the company. Um, so, so my day is quite different now. Um, essentially I come in and I, re- I sit down with my acquisition guy. I find out what he's working on and then we'll sit down and we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at some of the deals that, uh, that, that he's working on. And, um, and then, um, if I need to, I'll pull my, the president of my property management company in her name's Leslie. Uh, she's been with me for, um, 12 years and, um, she manages, um, most of all of our employees. And so, um, and then there's different pieces and different team members that we'll utilize, um, in, in our uh, resources now. So if I'm looking at something, let's say in San Antonio, I'll call one of my uh, employees down there or I'll have my uh, acquisition guy call and we'll have them go by the property. We'll have them do a rent survey, those kinds of things. So I spend a lot of time um, finding deals and, um, and then also managing the debt and equity relationships. Um, I had a, a big meeting yesterday with uh, Wells Fargo on a construction deal that we're doing um, in, um, in Tucson and, and um, I'm in the middle of negotiating an, uh, another one with uh, with a group out of Laguna Beach. And so, um, you know, and then I did the radio interview with Robert today. So it just depends, you know, and I do some, I do some teaching uh, and, and books and things like that, but it's really, 
um, very secondary. I donate all that stuff. I donate all those proceeds to charity um, on everything we do with everything. That's I great. Do with Saki, yeah. That's awesome. That's, great. That's cool. Well, hey, let, let's move kind of back to the, the process. We talked about finding properties. We talked about kind of, you know, looking at them, figuring out what a good market is. But actually, we find a property, let's say. We do our due diligence on it, and now we want to buy it. But we don't have any money. Obviously, most people don't have $9.1 million to go out and buy a property. So what are you doing, and, and what do people do for to, to finance yeah. these things? Well, it's important to know that I started at the same spot. I didn't know at all how to raise capital. I didn't know what the bank was going to ask me when I went in. So I think what happens is a lot of people stop right here because they're fearful that they need to know, especially the, you know, the, what I call the A students, you know, you know, they, (laughs) they, uh, they want to know everything before they step in, you know, but what they find out is even then they don't, you know, because, uh, you just never know what people are going to ask or what they're going to do. So I jump in feet first on, on everything. Um, and, um, so, uh, you know, what I, what I found is, um, uh, the first, the first people that I ever went to were my uh, friends and family, of course. And, and now, um, uh, now they've got this great thing, like, like, you know, bigger pockets and they've got, you know, these things on LinkedIn and they, they, you, there's a lot of resources where you can get your deal out there quickly. That didn't exist, um, when I started, but. Um, I got a lot of no's and, and, um, you know, uh, those no's were good for me because, you know, you're like, okay. Um, you know, and I never asked, you know, what I, I never was trying to sell through it. I was always asking, how can I make this presentation better? What do I need to learn? And, um, so I just got a whole heck of a lot of no's until I finally, uh, and of course the very first deal I used my own money, but then after I used my own money, I didn't have any money. So, <laughs> you know, like everybody, you know, at, at, at that point you gotta, you gotta figure out how to scale it. And, and, um, so what I chose to do on the equity side is I chose to go out and find what they call accredited investors. So, um, you know, we now have a database of over 500 accredited investors of investors that work with us. Um, and, you know, and, and I, you know, it, it took a long time to get to this point. But uh, when we put this deal out in Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, it funded in 20 minutes wow. uh, with our accredited investors. And, 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 you know, that sounds all great, but I, I want you to know that the road to get to that point. Yeah. Uh, was was not um uh it was not that easy that was not a 20 minute road <laughs> <laughs> hey ken what uh tell us what an accredited investor is and and yeah sorry. Uh, just uh, so people know that's uh, okay so accredited investors i mean you can google it too but it's it's basically means that you have a million dollars in net worth not including your house um and you have uh i think it's like three hundred thousand dollars a year in income coming and so um, and so my experience has been that especially now, you know, people are really confused as to what to do. You know, they're saving money. They're put, they, you know, the stock market's dicey, you know, the 401k stuff's dicey. Uh, people lost money in their pensions and, and there's a lot of people that are really confused. So, um, if, if you put together the right team and you can say, listen, you know, you're going to make, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten percent cash on cash over here in this investment and it makes sense, uh, it's actually not that hard to raise capital if you know what you're talking about. Gotcha. Do you offer just uh, like a flat interest? Do you offer equity as well, or does it depend on the deal? Oh, well, we give equity, um, uh, of course, to our investors on every deal. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, I, and I invest alongside of them now. I mean, when I started, I did it because I didn't have anything. But, um, yeah, we, we, uh, we invest right alongside of them. Okay. Gotcha. That's, that's cool. Hey, Ken, what, what would you say you think is the most important part of your presentation that really needed the most refinement over all the years? You know, clearly folks are out there, you know, putting together packages, uh, but where did you really screw up the most and what do you find that your investors are, are uh, most interested in? Yeah, um, great question. I, I think the most overlooked person in the whole team is the property manager. And, um, you know, the reason why I bring that up, even that I, I, I really believe I had a competitive advantage when I started because, and here's why I'll, I'll give you one example. One, to, this is back when I was doing fee management. I got this call from this guy in San Diego. That's, he got a crazy offer on his building 
and he ten, did a 1031 tax deferred exchange, which means that he could roll all those proceeds into the next building without any tax. Well, he found a building, put it in escrow, went hard on the money, which means it's non-refundable uh, in a property in Phoenix, that, uh, which is where I live. And uh, he called me one day before he closed. And he said, hey, I need a property manager. Oh, that's right. I need, I need a property manager. <laughs> and so we showed up and of course the building's full of thugs and it's got all these problems and he overpaid and you know, the expenses didn't add up and all those things. And so um, this is a guy that came out of like a 75 unit building in, um, in San Diego that was 100% occupied and he was on his boat every day to fly into Phoenix for a 150 unit building that was that, you know, uh, in the first six months, you know, went more vacant than it than it was occupied. And then, so then he was pissed at me, right? <laughs> I, I ripped the I ripped the bandaid off, right? And I said, "Listen, this is what you have. You're you, you're the idiot." So, so anyway, um, and so it's it's a great question, but I I think that if somebody has that type of folks, you know, those folks have in there on their team, they don't, you know, because every it, it all boils down to how the property performs after you buy it. Period. So whatever the property produces in free cash flow is a direct result of the manager. And if that's you or somebody else, and if that manager, um, that manager uh, is, and you made a good, good selection, that manager can sell the investment for you. That's cool. Yeah. That's really, really good advice. Because I don't, I don't think most investors even consider that. Like you said, they just, here's the numbers, here's how cool it is, here's how great it is. But what about the actual making it? That now, what? Yeah, now what? <laughs> that's uh, that's what it's all based on, right? It's like yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. We're gonna buy it, but it, you know, uh, but you don't get any money. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hey, Ken. So, so really quickly on on this, um, what makes a good property manager? I mean, how how would you identify the difference between somebody who's just a total loser and somebody who's killing it? Yeah. Um, well, you know, obviously, we have a management company, so I have a lot of experience in this area. Um, first of all, experience is, is a big one. So, um, great attitude. I know it sounds simple, but if, if, um, a lot of people don't, so, you know, just like any business, you can, you can find people that have been in the management business for 20 plus years and, um, you know, and they have a bad attitude. So, um, you'd be surprised when people walk in the office, um, you know, if it's, uh, you know, if it's like Nordstrom, you know, it's all, you know, everybody's happy and things are good and customer service is high. Um, the, they're going to stay, they're going to pay the rent on time. You know, things are going to get done. The maintenance, the maintenance requests are going to be done. Um, so I think attitude and, and experience are, are the two main things. Um, and then, um, uh, if I had to choose between the two, I would choose attitude first and train them. That's, Pick somebody who's good. trainable. Yeah. Because people with good attitudes are trainable. Yeah. You know, they're like, what can I do? What can I do? How can I get better? Where, um, you know, so I mean, it's nice to have people with experience, and of course, you don't want to put them in a disadvantaged situation. And, and uh, you know, when you got these uh, multi-million-dollar assets, but um, what we what we've developed is a system to where we 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 bring great people in with great attitudes, and we put them underneath people and, and have them train for a while, and then um, and then it, as as uh, the company evolves, they become uh, managers and leaders in our company. That's cool. That's cool. Um, why don't we Why don't we go to one more topic before we kind of begin to start wrapping things up here, and that's the due diligence period. I talked about it a little bit ago. What should somebody be doing doing after they get their property offer accepted and before closing the period you're in right now on this Oklahoma property? What are you What are you doing to make sure it's good? Yeah, that in my opinion, that's where all the magic happens. Um, it's we do everything in due diligence, and so when I say that, so in in ten days. Um, I walked every all 208 units. I audited every file, and I had contractors on the roof, the landscaping, the parking lots, the electrical, the plumbing, and everything. Um, so it, you, it's really got to be coordinated and orchestrated. And of course, I have a full time person. That's all she does is 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 orchestrate that. You know, we have a huge checklist. Uh, people can find it on my website, actually, uh, KenMcElroy.com. Uh, I've got a due diligence checklist up there and it just gives, it's like, I think it's eight or nine pages. Um, and we ask for everything we can and we go through everything. And so, so what it does, 
Uh, my experience has been that that's when you find out everything. So we're looking at bank statements. We're looking at financials. Um, we're looking at vacancies. We're looking at, you know, I don't want to spend a bunch of money after I buy it. I want to know what's happening inside the units. I want to know if I'm going to have to replace a carpet or refrigerator in three or four months or six months or one year, even two years. All that stuff we do, uh, we package it all up and we make it part of our business plan. Um, so I love due diligence because it's, it's the opportunity to flush everything out that even the, perhaps the seller doesn't know. Yeah. It's like discovery when it comes to uh, legal pursuits, right? Exactly right. Yeah. So um, you, so, you, sorry, real quick. Ahead. You actually said you personally walked through all 200 yeah. of those units. Or oh, do actually, you... I, 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 gotta be, I, I did. <laughs> I say we, like my team. Uh, <laughs> I, I, nice. must confess, I actually haven't even seen this property yet. Um, okay. I'm going to fly down there um, after we close it in January. But, um, you know, we have a team now of people that I underwrote it. I've seen all the pictures and I've talked to the managers and, you know, I'm involved. But um, uh, and we've had lots of people at the property, but uh, I haven't I haven't been there yet. Like and, I was just uh, trying to do the math on how long it would take to walk through 200 units. So I'm like, you, you'd be there uh, like a month. Yeah. Uh, well, a team of two can do about 60 units a day. Wow. OK. There you go. So if you bring three teams down there. Um, you can you can knock out 200 units uh, pretty pretty close to 200 units in 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 a day or two. Okay. Have you have you found uh, any kind of pushback at all uh, from from potential sellers like oh well you know we got people and they don't want you to see the units I mean that's obviously a massive red flag but I'm I'm assuming you you've dealt with that kind of stuff. Oh before. yeah, of course yeah yeah we, we there's all kinds of great stories of what you find inside the units and <laughs> dealing with, dealing with sellers and. Um, yes, you know, and, and tenants change their locks and, you know, there's all kinds of stuff going on behind those doors. <laughs> yep. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, for sure. Well, I, I think the due diligence is probably the, the most, you know, for, for the experienced investor, that's probably the most fun. I think that's, you know, everything else is kind of operational, but that, that's kind of where the excitement comes in. What, what, what kind of uh, pig am I going to end up with, you know, and can I turn this thing or, and, and make it into a, you know, beautiful white horse, right? That's right. And, and it's, it's, I love it. I'm with you, Joshua. I think it's when everything gets exposed or should be at least. And it's your opportunity also to go back and tell the seller about things that he may not have known or she may not have known. Um, you know, we found that in some cases, um, you know, like in one property in, um, in Richardson, Texas, uh, they had, they had put a third roof on, which is illegal from a fire department standpoint. You, you're only supposed to do two. Um, and so that was a red flag and, you know, that was a $700,000 fix. Whoa. So there's, there's things like that that come up and yeah. are important. Yeah, oh, for yeah. sure. For sure. All right. Well, why, why don't we move on to, uh, my favorite part of the podcast. We call this the fire round. It's time for the fire round. All right, these the fire round. These are all questions that come directly from uh, the Bigger Pockets forums. So these are questions that real people are asking, and oh, I thought good. I'd fire some of them at you. So, uh, first of all, how do you determine a local cap rate? Like, who do you ask about that, yeah, or do you not the, ask anyone? Yeah, the cap rates. Uh, the brokers all know what they are. Uh, okay. A cap capitalization rate. All it is is if you paid all cash for a property. Uh, the rate of return would be the cap rate. If you put debt on it, um, it's the NOI divided by the sales price. So um, it's pretty simple. I mean, it's whatever the NOI was and whatever the price was, it determines the cap rate. Stronger markets have lower cap rates. And, um, and of course, interest rates can also bear, uh, uh, make cap rates go up. Okay. And we'll link to a couple articles, too, uh, in the show notes at biggerpockets.com slash show52 uh, that talk about the whole cap rate thing, too. So. Anyway, right people on. are more interested in that. We got stuff. Yep. All right. So should somebody start with apartments or, or do you advise they start with single family houses and, and uh, other property types? Yeah, I do. I advise they start small with a single family house or a condo or a duplex and, and then move up, uh, you know, and, and it's just, you know, the mistakes are smaller and, and um, you're better off. You're going to make smaller um, financial mistakes, too. Gotcha. Okay. Good. Uh, 55 plus communities. Do you recommend them or do you say stay away from them? Well, I have them. Um, and so uh, I'm going to say yes. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> stay away. So, no, here's the deal. I mean, if you study, one of the trends I study is the demographics of the baby boomers, of course. And they started retiring a couple of years ago at what, 50,000 a day or something like that. So it's coming and um, it is definitely coming. Uh, what I found, however, 
is um, well, there's there's pros and cons. The the pros are that uh, they never move. You know, once they make a decision, they stay there if if the places run well, and they're amazing people, um, and um, they have great stories. And um, the uh, the downside is that they don't make decisions quickly because they don't have to, and so. If you're, you know, when we, uh, when you, if you're leasing one up, uh, it's brand new. Um, it's going to take a lot longer than you, than you think. And the other thing is, is they don't want anything to do with the next level of care for them. So they don't want any, they don't want to see assisted care. Um, you've got, you've got major different levels. So you have active seniors that are 55, um, and then when they start getting to a point to where they need um, some kind of assistance, assistance in whatever manner that might be. There's the next level, and then of course there's congregate care, which is um, uh, toward the end. And and so uh, there's been, you know, uh, we live in Arizona, so down in Sun City they tried this. They tried putting all three in one community, and it, it failed miserably because um, none of the active people wanted to see where they were heading. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. It's funny. I I. Uh, you know, since I was a kid, my, my mom was always like, don't you ever, ever put me in a home, you know, how dare you? don't think about it. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I think about it. I'm like, when I'm 55, 65, put me in one of these communities. I want to go play checkers and hang and shuffleboard and dancing all the time. You know, I'd be bored stiff if I was in a house with nobody nearby. Oh, dude. And let me tell you something like men are a commodity too. Cause they yeah. Oh, you stop, if, if you can make it, you're going to be a stud. <laughs> <laughs> no, nice. That's nice. funny. All right. So, uh, next question: How does uh, financing work for construction loans on apartments? Uh, quite a bit trickier. Um, you know, the there's a lot of underwriting that the the banks. I just uh, as I said, I I just met with Wells Fargo on this yesterday. Um, typically, they're underwriting uh, somewhere between sixty five and seventy percent loan to cost. So, let's say it costs twenty million bucks to build an apartment project. Um, they're going to lend you 65 to 70 percent. Uh, the other thing is um, they're usually recourse loans, uh, which is which means that uh, you personally are on the hook for um, uh, you know for the performance of the, of the of the property. So it's it's a the you know from my standpoint it's a pretty risky loan. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, because of most of the apartment loans that I'm doing are non recourse uh, with Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Um, you know, they typically don't have those kinds of uh, restrictions. Gotcha. Okay, cool. All right. I want to buy an apartment complex. What is my very first step? Like, what should I do today? Um, well, uh, the, the, the first thing is uh, you want to go to where the demand is. So like I have a, I have a friend that's actually based out of Seattle that uh, they specialize in student housing. So I was just talking to him last week. Um, so he just bought a building near Oregon State, and um, you know because of the um, uh, the the student housing uh, was full and had a, a big waiting list. So so when you start to see opportunities like that, wherever that might be, as you start to do your research, therein lies um, you know therein lies the reason. So uh, and and so once you start to study a specific sector and become specialized like my friend um, in the student housing or, or even in the senior housing or uh, affordable housing or, or, you know, high end, whatever, whatever, because there's all kinds of different kinds of apartments. Yeah. Um, you really need to understand that niche. Um, that's probably the very first thing because um, you can really make a lot of mistakes if, um, if you don't understand it from a, from a, from, you know, from a demographic standpoint. Yeah, it's great. Gotcha. Great. Gotcha. All right, Ken. The big, the big question: Real estate goals for the future. Where do you see yourself in five to ten years? Um, I, I see myself um, working about the same, um, <laughs> and nice. um, you know, um, taking a lot of time off. Uh, I see our company more than doubling, and um, you know, uh, I, I also see the apartment market is going to peak probably mm-hmm. in in uh, two to three years. So, um, you know, we'll probably, we're already starting to look at things like self storage and, and, um, um, you know, mobile home parks and, and things like that, uh, to, to take advantage of that, whatever that next, uh, phase is. But, you know, construction has a cycle, apartments have a cycle, everything has a cycle. And, and the, the worst mistake I can make is, is, um, investing at the top of the cycle. 
Yeah. 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 And knowing what that cycle is and just paying close attention That's to, right. to, to tops and bottoms and, and understanding that I think is really key for sustainability over a long period of time. Yeah. It's the difference of legacy uh, versus um, making a lot of money in a cycle. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. All right. Well, it's time, Brandon. It's time for the famous four. All right. So these are questions we ask to every guest we have on here. Uh, first question, uh, Josh, why don't you start us off? All right. So besides your own books, of course, because you know those those would likely be your favorite real estate books. Uh, what what other than your own would would be uh, those the, your favorites? In real estate, that, sure. should I should I try re spitting that out there? <laughs> that was really difficult for some reason. Sure, dude. No, get it. No, okay. I, I get it. Um, actually, I have it right here. Um, the um, this book here, Art of the uh, Deal, is that what that is? That Trump wrote. It's called the best real estate advice I ever received. It's interesting. It's a it's a small book that didn't get a lot of fanfare, yeah. but. It's got a lot of really, really good advice in it. Uh, he just went to a bunch of his buddies and said, um, you know, and, and put it all together in this book. So this is one of the best ones that I've read in a long, long time. Cool. Oh, I, ha- I haven't read that. I'll, uh, I'll make sure to get that. That's cool. All right. What about your favorite business book, non-real estate? Non-real estate. Uh, well, you might, you may know. I got a few. We, you know, we study books as a company. Uh, we, we, last year, we studied a book called uh, Turning Pro, which is this one. Uh, Stephen Pressfield, uh, we're just trying to get our employees to think differently. Uh, we just got done with one called um, uh, Tribal Leadership, um, which is a great book. Uh, talks about um, tribes and, and, and how the natural hierarchy of tribes. And We just did that last week. We brought 100 of our people in to Scottsdale and, and study that. The, and then the, I just did a book study with Robert Kiyosaki, actually. we studied, He gave me this book, and I read it. Um, which is a great book called Crash Course um, and uh, Chris Martinson, uh, and this is all, this ha- this has a lot to do about trade and and foreign currencies and and things like that. Um, it's very big picture trend stuff. Um, the guy's a scientist and he puts it, he puts it all together in graphs and stuff. And nice. So these are the, these are the books that I just got done reading. So those are oh, great. That's ones. Great. Awesome. All all choices we haven't yet heard. So that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Uh, what about hobbies? What do you do for fun? I, it sounds like you got some kids, so I'm sure spending time with them is part yeah. of it. Oh yeah. Kids are a big hobby. You know, I, uh, my goal is to make them entrepreneurs. Um, and, um, you know, my fourth book was, it's called the sleeping giant, uh, is all about entrepreneurship. And, um, so they're on their third business. They're uh, 15 and 12. And, um, you know, it's, it's, so I'm having a great time just talking to them about all the things that, um, that come up day to day. Um, you know, we I had a meeting with a marketing, a PR company here in Scottsdale and they did the presentation. Oh, nice. I'm um, slowly, um, that's a biggie for me, a big passion of mine. I, I don't want them to uh, be spoiled rich kids. Um, and, um, you know, I, I don't want them to be entitled, and and uh, I want them also to have the freedom to do what they want uh, when they want it. Uh, so that's a biggie. But also, you know, I, I I love outdoor water skiing. You know, snow skiing, going up to Whistler in a couple of weeks, and nice golf. I'm playing golf tomorrow. I'm nice. in a match. I'm in a tournament. So, so <laughs> good luck. You know, right on. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's very cool. All right, well. Awesome. Uh, last question from me and the last question of the famous four. Uh, what do you believe sets apart successful real estate investors from those who maybe never gain any traction or just don't don't find success? Yeah, it's it's actually uh, it's funny you bring that up because it's in this book. Tribal, <laughs> um, you know, uh, there's five levels that they determine in there. And the, the third level is what they call um, I'm great and you're not. <laughs> nice. And, um, the nanana poo poo level. Uh, the guy who the, the the this guy was a professor at Stanford. He he did 20, he interviewed twenty thousand companies and and he felt like fifty percent of everybody falls into this category, which is a very I mentality. Um, and then the fourth level is more of a we mentality. So the whole theme of my company event was you know going from from we to me um, and uh, or from me to we. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, the point is is that I think back. This is all team based. So every every successful person I've ever seen, um, and you you know who I mean you, you know the list is 
huge, you know, it, like guys like Richard Branson and, you know, Steve Jobs. And you look at these guys and, you know, they leverage their talent with people around them to do, um, to, you know, to, to make an impact. And uh, of course those are big names, but there's a lot of small guys that do it too. And so if, if, uh, where I've seen people kind of go up and down and rise up and down based on the economy or a trend, it's because they, they think that they're the reason that they're successful. And, um, and, um, and, and, you know, and they're very, very egocentric and they're very eye based. Um, and they don't value the, the, the power of a team. And for me, um, you know, one of the reasons that we're in business and we got, we, we grew, we doubled in the recession. Uh, we bought $300 million worth of real estate in the recession. Wow. Um, and I, that was when I went out and found the best people cause they were on the market, um, and built my company up to, to, you know, to where it is. And, and, um, and I think that that's the biggest mistake is, is they, they try to do everything themselves. Um, and they don't realize that there are people out there that are uh, that that are very very good at certain things that will um, um, free them up to 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 grow. That's great. Wow. That's great. And and can I say, Brandon, I value you. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> I'm glad you leverage my talents. <laughs> Well, well, Ken, listen, it's, it's really been a pleasure. You know, I, we, we kept it brief. We didn't really get to dig in, uh, too deeply on, on, uh, a lot of the topics that I think Brandon and myself, and I'm sure all the listeners would have loved us to, and, and perhaps down the line at some point we can have you back and we, we can do an intensive or some kind of focus on yeah. one or the other. Uh, I love this stuff. It's, it's easy for me. I just, um, do it right from my desk. So there you go. There you go. Well, where where can people find out more information about you? Um, well, my my company is uh, MC Companies, M C C O M P A N I E S. Uh, so you can check that out. www.mccompanies. And then I have a personal website, which is kenmacelroy.com. Um, and um, and I'm launching a video series actually next year for a lot of these questions that I get. Um, uh, you know, just two to four minute videos on a number of topics. So, um, you know, cause I get a ton of emails as you can imagine, uh, yeah. from uh, the books and the Kiyosaki stuff. So this gives me a format to kind of direct everybody to that. And that's going to be called Ken flicks that's coming out in, in January. So I'm excited about that. Oh, right on. That's great. That's great. Cool. Well, Ken, it's, it's been a, a real pleasure. Um, I'm, I'm very uh, glad that we were able to have you on and, and look forward to keeping in touch. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks guys. And, and, uh, just reach out whenever you want to chat again on any topic. Uh, happy to do it. Awesome. Well, Fabulous. Thank you, Ken. All right, everybody. That was show 52 of the Bigger Pockets podcast with Ken McElroy, best selling author and uh, very, very experienced real estate investor. Uh, and, 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 and let me add a very, very nice guy. As you guys can tell, he's uh, super cool and, and, it's kind of neat, you know, when when uh, you know you've got these these folks who you know, we all kind of look up and admire because they've they've written or done something you know special like you know, Ken and his books, um, and and they turn out to be uh, pretty decent people too. So uh, it's uh, it's really it was nice to to get to chat with him. It was also anyway, cool. I don't know if people noticed. I mean, I'm sure they noticed, but I just wanted to point out the fact that he says he donates all his the stuff he gets from the whole rich dad thing and the books, he donates that all to charity. That is awesome. That is so. definitely, definitely awesome. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, I don't know. I, I, I'm sure other people do that, but, but I, I, I imagine they're selling thousands and thousands of books and, and, and the amount of money that they make, uh, that he makes is, is probably not insignificant. So that's, that's fabulous. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, as usual, thanks again for checking us out. If you are new to the show or uh, unfamiliar with Bigger Pockets, please come and join us on the site, biggerpockets.com, an amazing network of real estate investors. And, uh, you know, there's tons and tons and tons of free information uh, to, uh, to check out. Uh, join today, get involved, and introduce yourself to the community. Otherwise, uh, of course, join us on Facebook, facebook.com slash biggerpockets. Uh, definitely uh, get with us on Twitter, G+, YouTube, and, uh, and all the other major networks as well. And, uh, of course, come back next week for our next show, Show 53, which should be a good one as well. 
We appreciate you listening. Thanks again. I'm Josh Dorkin, your host. Brandon, take it out. All right. Well, this is Brandon signing off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.